Good morning, everyone. We are just about to start the morning session of the second day of the Cold War International Students Conference. My name is Bona Bashwede. I come from Slovakia. I work at the History Department of the Faculty of Education of University Sheja in Komarno in Slovakia. And uh, I'm a Cold War historian dealing with some uh, Cold War media uh, studies and also doing some uh, international relations. Uh, we are going to have a, a great panel today, but before we start, and we still need some time to fix the technical issues, uh, I would like to uh, tell something about the, the International Cold War Students Conference. We have been, this conference was established <coughs> and started by Professor Chaba Bikish, and I'm glad I'm honored to have been in relationship with him and with the conference for, I think, for a decade now, which is a great pleasure on my, my side. And um, I think this is a unique, uh, uh, we can bravely say it's a unique opportunity for young scholars to come together and to listen to and to engage, being engaged in, in lovely scientific uh, conversation. And uh, I would like to point out to the uniqueness of this uh, international event. Professor Bekish has been doing a job which is unique in its form and its content. Uh, he has made a research on, on, on Central European scale. What in my eyes makes his work unique is that he is able to collect and translate documents from uh, different uh, Central and Eastern European countries into English and thus making them available for international scholars. So thank you, Professor, for organizing this event and thank you for inviting me. And I would like to grab the opportunity to present your book, which is, a, mm -hmm. again, a, a wonderful book originally written in Hungarian a couple of years ago, Hungary's Cold War. And the book was just has been just published in, in the United States and is going to be uh, to have uh, 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 a review session in the H. Diplo online international magazine, and I'm happy to be a part of this uh, endeavor. So I would love to attract your attention to Professor Bekesh's book, which is a unique insight into the, into the Cold War issues from Central European perspective, I think, and uh, hopefully you will find many interesting reading in it. Um, I would like to to present to introduce the the uh, lecturers of this morning panel in order of appearance. Uh, Daniel Quiroga is going to be the first. Grace Simpson is going to be the second. Then we, are ex we, we do expect to have a third member of the panel from Romania who is, he said, he may come at 12 o'clock or mm -hmm. around 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So we will see if he's on time. He will be on time, then we will have him right at 12 o'clock through Zoom. And fourth, in order, medicine, medicine surgeon. Uh, so I'm looking forward to lovely presentations, I'm sure uh, they will be lovely presentations. If the technique is all right, mm -hmm. is it okay? If you are all right, then okay. the floor, Daniel, is yours. We, are, we have 20 minutes, and please, I will, I, I will uh, make you a sign to warn you at 15 minutes. Is it okay? Good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'll stand if that's okay, Simon, with the camera. And yes, thank you. You can turn off. Sorry to make the cave, but the presentation is very visual and I want to share a couple of nice images with all of you. So today I'll be presenting one of the chapters of my dissertation titled Ahead of the Times, Erecting the United Nations Headquarters at the Dawn of the Cold War. And this is part of my broader project titled Architects of the Better World, the Birth of the International Parliamentary Conflicts, 1918-1998. And I took the title of the broader project from a speech delivered by the US President Truman that we were just talking about, in which he urged the delegates at the San Francisco conference 
to see themselves as architects of the better world in their efforts to create the United Nations. And I thought it was a telling example of the ways in which my field, international lawyers, but also neighboring colleagues for international history, international relations, even perhaps political science, with apologies to SAC, use metaphors that come from architecture and geography to make sense of international politics. But my suspicion with this project is that behind all of this very florid metaphorical language, we actually know very little about the actual places in which the international is concretely disputed, made and erected. And what I wanted to do in this project then is the following. To, my, my argument is that the 20th century saw the emergence of what I would like to call the international parliamentary complex. And theoretically, I am coming from a tradition of Foucauldian work that is very much concerned by the relationship between infrastructural relays, systems of knowledge and relationships of power. Perhaps you're, fa you're familiar with the kind of more famous works in the birth of the prison, the birth of the clinic. And what I wanted to do was to something similar with this idea of the parliamentary complex which is not only an architectural building, but it's something broader than that. It's a dispositive, it's an entanglement of ideas about representation, participation, and democracy that mediate your understanding of international community, and I hope to argue, of international law. And what I'm arguing then is that the 20th century saw the development of this international parliamentary complex as a way to, let's say, effectualize or to make reality Wilson's first point, his invitation to have open public covenants, always frankly in the public view. And this is an ideal that requires infrastructures, that requires technologies, that requires technical developments, systems of note taking, seating arrangements, ways of dividing time of space to allow representation, all with this idea of democratizing the international sphere. And what I do then in this project is to suggest that the way that this became, the, the way that this occurred, is to the adaptation of what Latour would call parliamentary technologies of the domestic sort of parliamentary system to the international sphere. And in particular, the models of the foreign office of the British Empire, and to a lesser degree, the National Assembly of the French Empire as a way to reimagine international politics in the 20th century. And we'll talk about the Congress of the US a little bit later. The, in, in, with this in mind, these are the sort of questions that I'm interested in asking in this project. On the one hand, how did this emergence of these new spaces of international politics were co-produced and co-produced visions of international society, who belonged in it and who was excluded? Secondly, which resources and constraints did these material places impose on those who participated in diplomatic or lawmaking projects within them? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, what are the hierarchies? What are the biases and what are the blind spots that we can see in the creation of the palaces that were created to host the parliaments of mankind, to use Paul Kennedy's famous title of his history of the UN? This is the kind of broader table of contents of the project. And the idea is that I want to tell a story that begins with interwar Geneva, the League of Nations, etc., goes all the way to the end of the Cold War and the 90s. And today I'll be focusing here on chapter five in particular in the United Nations headquarters. This is a little bit of a shame because I won't get the opportunity to tell you about the wonderful sources that I explored the last week at the Open Society Archives, partially because they were related to one of the final chapters on summit diplomacy and the 1993 Vienna Conference on Human Rights. And hopefully maybe we'll return one day to tell you more about that chapter later down the line. But I thought that before going to New York, I wanted just to give you a recap of the kind of arguments that the previous chapters have been making and that lead the way to the kind of intervention regarding New York. So the first chapter really explores this idea of the parliamentary complex, and I'll be very quick to this, but basically the argument is that throughout the 19th century, there was a shift from the kind of more aristocratic tradition of congresses, often bilateral school of parties, music, to a kind of more bourgeois, legalistic, and that's interesting for my purpose as a lawyer, and bureaucratic tradition of conferencing. And there's just a couple of how my sources try to trace that movement, especially uh, through the use of parliamentary language. So the idea is that, for instance, a place like the Paris Peace Conference is very different to the Congress of Vienna because it is increasingly parliamentarized. And here what I'm doing is that I'm drawing from the argument of Gary Simpson, a legal scholar, that says that the creation of international courts gave way to a unification of international relations. And I'm trying to use this idea of unification, but not to think through the spaces of courts, but rather of this international parliaments. And again, there are many examples we can give of this. This is, for instance, a moment in which in the League of Nations General Assembly, it is debated that we need to adopt the use of the parliamentary technology of Great Britain, who after all is the modern parliamentary government. And you can see this reflected, for instance, in the Paris Peace Conference. Then the next chapter really settles on the first building created to host an international organization, 
which is the building created to host the International Labor Organization, and now, for a very different history, is the home to the World Trade Organization. And here, what I do in this chapter... Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, we lost. It's a shame, because here there were important, nice pictures. Yeah. Some of them for Grace in particular, but we'll get to that in a second. So what I try to do in this chapter is to tell the story of how this building came into being. What were the political economy behind the donations of the land? What were the competitions between not only Geneva, but Brussels and Paris and other cities in their attempt to become this hub of international politics? And precisely because it's the International Labour Organization, the interesting fact is that in the debates that you see around the building, there are claims that this represents modern labour law that is a building that is democratic, that is egalitarian, that allows the equal participation of the working class in international politics. But of course, there is not one working class internationalism. There are many, there, there are many. And that's why it's, in this chapter, I try to show how the different donations, interior decorations, the design of the building itself, reflect disputes between different communities that all claim the mantle of internationalism. Here, the example is a kind of more social, uh, social democratic labor union, which donated this panel with some different excerpts of the Treaty of Versailles in, three, in four different languages, compared to the kind of more Catholic, oh, sorry, compared to the kind of more Catholic artwork that the Catholic labor unions are going to donate. And you see all of these disputes very palpable in this building. And this is what I hope is particularly interesting for Grace, of course. <laughs> then the next chapter really explores the Palais de Nation, which as you might know was really the headquarters of the League of Nations. It only really came into being quite late when the League was already looking at a very dire situation. And there's only two things I want to rescue from this chapter before we move to New York. The first is that something that is very important for the purposes of the later conversation is that the place in which the League was erected, where the way where the Palais was elected, a very important consideration was a last minute donation by the Rockefeller family to erect a new library of the Palais de Nation that forced the different options to move here from the lake side of the Lake, of lake Leman up to the Ariana Hill. And I'll go in a second on why that's important for New York. But I think the biggest kind of tension I want to highlight Sorry, you cannot see this quite well. But the big tension I want to highlight is that this palais was erected to an international competition of architects, in which all member states of the League, and that's not everyone, it's not Americans, it's not Russians, but anyhow, all member states of the Leagues could participate in this comp architectural competition. And it was a diplomatic disaster. There was a lot of backlash, there were a lot of tensions in this. And for our purposes in New York, what is interesting is that the famous Swiss-French architect, Le Corbusier, submitted a proposal that was eventually ch shunned. It was not seen as interesting. It was too fringe. You cannot see it very well here, but it's very representative of what would later be called the modern or the international style in architecture. And it's really shocking contrast with the kind of more neoclassical building that we actually got in Geneva, that you, hear here, you see here on the left, much more of a classical temple with this kind of Greek columns, very awkward, very historicist, compared to this, which looks much more to a modern let's say, office building. Why is this interesting? Because now, once we move to New York, Le Corbusier and the Rockefellers will be crucial actors. Mm. So I begin this chapter by showing how, after the end of World War II, the big question at the forefront of many of the actors I'm studying is, well, where do we go now after San Francisco? Yeah, we have a wonderful organization, but where are we going to actually implement? Is it going to be in San Francisco? Are we going to give the League in Geneva another chance? It was a little bit awkward because the last time the League Assembly had met in Geneva, it had done so to expel the Soviet Union. So maybe there are memories we don't want to remember about that. Are we going to go to another American city? Are we going to go to Philly? Are we going to stay in New York? And what I want to try to show in this chapter is a little bit the decision-making process and the political economy behind it. As some of you might know, the, the, the point that I'm really trying to make is that there's a shift from Europe both as a center of gravity of international relationship, uh, international relations, but more broadly in the kind of aesthetical and ideas about what is modern to begin with. Partially because many of the modern kind of movements in architecture, design, etc., had to leave Europe and Central Europe during World War II. But most dramatically, because now this international style that when Corbusier was working on in the 20s and 30s was seen as very marginal and very French, now is going to come to the forefront. But the tension I want to analyze here is this idea that the international style is at the same time belonging to all country and to none. How can a style be truly international if we know that all of its architects come from certain countries? And what I highlight then is that all of my actors were very aware 
that the world of tomorrow, to echo, to echo the slogan of the World Fair of 1939, has to be a world very different from the, war, from the world of the interwar period. And in particular, it has to be a different world in terms of US engagement and US involvement in the international project. Nobody wanted the, the US to be, again, the gap in the bridge as it had been in the interwar period. And even what remained of the League of Nations, then in Princeton, in Princeton the economic and financial organization of the League, were very aware that the world would have to look quite different. And that's the kind of key tension of this chapter. How can we make an international order that is both deeply international and committed to a new world, but also deeply parochial and invested in US domestic politics, political economy discussions, and so on. And this like, reference to the world, to the 1939 welfare, I think it's interesting because as some of you might know, actually the remaining buildings that were used for the 1939 welfare were actually one of the first homes of the United Nations because the building in Manhattan was not built in a day. And there's another kind of project that I want to pursue more about this improvised spaces, the spaces that were very temporal, very uncomfortable for these organizations. But while this, let's say, while the decision was being taken on where the UN was going to settle, and it is important to know that staying in this Flushing Meadows Corona Park, the 1939 setup, was actually an option. In fact, the very famous US urbanist Robert Moses was actually quite in favor about that. But eventually, as some of you might see in the flesh, well, the place that was selected was a place in Turtle Bay, Manhattan. And I think all international lawyers, international historians have a rough idea of how this came to be. It was also a donation from the Rockefellers. But I want, what I want to do is to explore a little bit the decision process more, more carefully. And I should mention that this is part of the archival work that I want to do really next fall. Here I'm only playing a little bit with online sources. But even here you see in news and in the documents of the UN, very juicy discussions about how this reflects visions of international politics. What were the Soviet position in all of this? How, for instance, Arabic and Afro or Afro Asian states, to a degree, some of them were hesitant with settling the UN in New York, perhaps because of Zionist influence and its connection to a very particular tradition of internationalism. And here, I think the key actor I want to, for to place at the forefront, and I mean, this is interesting for my field because he's not a diplomat, he's not a lawyer, is the architect Wallace Harrison. Deeply involved with the Rockefeller family, was part of the, let's say, leading architects of the Rockefeller Center, and was involved in many of their projects after on. And of course, this donation from the Rockefellers meant that they would have a leading seat on how this is actually going to unfold. In fact, many of the original meetings of what would be the Board of Design, and I'll talk about that in a second, happened in the Rockefeller Center itself. So we would have then Wallace at the forefront, but the idea is that he would be tempered by an international <coughs> committee of architects. We're not going to have this confrontational kind of concours we had as we had in Geneva. This was very awkward. Now, we're all going to work together. It has to be a project that is homogeneous by consensus. But of course, how you reach those consensus are part of the question. And then I show then the politics of this board of design consultants. Here you have the kind of hierarchy of it, the members of different states. Famously, we have again Le Corbusier, we have an Oscar, a Brazilian architect called Oscar Niemeyer, and I'll talk about him in a second. We have a Soviet architect, and so on and so on. Now, usually how the story of this building is told is it was some sort of compromise between two of the kind of main visions of these members of the board and design. The two of them reined in, in a way, by Wallace. On the one hand, Niemeyer, which I already mentioned, and that would become very later famous by creating the capital of Brazil, Brasilia, as a modern plan design grid kind of city. And then, of course, Le Corbusier, which was a much more senior figure, very respected in the international modernist tradition. But in many ways, we we'll told Niemeyer, you know, you're my disciple, you need to toe the line and come behind me. And basically, this is the kind of building that we had at the end. And what I want to do then is to tell a story that thinks about the international order, not only as made of doctrines or ideas, but actual brick and stone, a, a steel and glass, and even capital and labor. So I took this phrase ahead of the times by a speech delivered by Ban Ki-moon when Niemeyer died quite recently. And there's this idea that the UN building was ahead of the times, not only because of design, it was very modern, it looked like any other skyscraper in Manhattan, but also because it embodied this kind of idea of peace that would set the stage for what the diplomats and the lawyers would do later in. And what I want to, to conclude then is that I think it's also ahead of the times in a very other, different kind of way. And it's a building that is ahead of the times because it is one of the first instantiations in which a vision of the international would have to be forged that was at the same time loyal at every twist and turn to US interests. 
And that is the kind of connection that I want to finish in this paper. How do we think of an international order, international organizations, in which all the bureaucrats, all the servants, can be very easily removed by the US if need be? How do we think of a place that embodies an idea of democracy and representation of all states, but where some states are more equal than others? This is the direction I want to take with the project. The idea is that after this, I will explore conference spaces in the Global South, Bogota, my hometown, and Nairobi, and then, of course, Vienna, which I already mentioned. And this would create the narrative arc that brings us from Geneva to New York, Vienna, and Nairobi. I think I'll leave it here. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Especially thank you for the keeping the time. Uh, 15 minutes and 49 seconds. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there will be questions. As we agreed, uh, we may have questions uh, and answers uh, maybe after the second presentation uh, or, uh, or later, we'll see. Um, our next panelist is Grace Simpson. And Grace, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I would just like to express my sincere thanks to the organizers of this conference and also to the organizers of the Cold War Archival Research uh, Fellowship Program. And also thank you to all of the foregoing speakers. Uh, I've really enjoyed all of your presentations. Um, so the title of my presentation today is Ripping Away the Barriers that Have Separated Workers for Far Too Long, the Establishment of the International Miners Organization. The International Miners Organization, or the IMO, was established in Paris in September 1985. Its establishment represented an important juncture in the history of the international trade union movement during the Cold War. In 1949, during the early years of the Cold War, the international trade union movement became bifurcated. Um, the establishment of the IMO sought to remediate this bifurcation by uniting miners uh, unions from Western Bloc states, such as Great Britain and France, with miners unions from Soviet Bloc states, such as the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. And though one can trace the ideation of the IMO by these miners' unions back to the early 1970s, it was two developments in the late 1970s and early 80s which precipitated the establishment of the IMO. The false nuclear warnings of 1979 and 80, and the UK miners' strike of 1984 to 1985. So, it was here in Budapest that the very first IMO Bureau meeting took place in March 1986. According to its organisers, there would undoubtedly be unanimity in electing Budapest as one of Europe's most beautiful cities. It also hosted a meeting which could go down in the history of the international trade union movement. Whilst I'm sure we can agree that Budapest is very beautiful, um, this meeting and the IMO itself have been strikingly absent from the historiography of the Cold War and also the international trade union movement. And this is um, an absence which I hope to rectify here today with my presentation. So I will argue that the IMO was established in 1985 because of a mutually perceived lack of dialogue and cooperation between Western and Soviet miners unions and because of, perce because of a perceived need on behalf of Western miners' unions to engender nuclear disarmament. Um, the objectives of the IMO demonstrate that it was simultaneously a product of the international trade union movement, as had emerged in the 1860s, and um, a product of the Cold War. So, to provide you with a bit of context, um, in October 1945, the World Federation of Trade Unions, or WFTU, was established as an international trade union designed to globalize the international trade union movement by including affiliates from every part of the globe. In December 1949, however, um, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, or the ICFTU, was established as a kind of breakaway international trade union. And the American Federation of Labor, or AFL, uh, was particularly instrumental in, in this breakaway and ensured um, quite extensively that the ICFTU was pervaded by an ardent anti-communism. Um, so ICFTU affiliates were instructed to avoid bilateral exchanges with WFTU affiliates 
as they were deemed to be only interested in promoting Soviet policy and had no interest in improving the lot of the international working class. So although Western and Soviet divisions abounded, the international, uh, sorry, the Miners' Trades Union International, which was affiliated to the Soviet-aligned WFTU, and the Miners' International Federation, which was affiliated to the Western-aligned ICFTU, attempted to cooperate. Um, so the MIF actually ruled in 1968 that it was the prerogative of its affiliates um, to determine their level of interaction with affiliates of the Soviet-aligned WFTU. Um, but the fact that most miners' unions in the Western Bloc were simultaneously affiliated to the MIF and the ICFTU meant that they were effectively constrained uh, from instigating or partaking in bilateral exchanges. Um, please forgive me for all of the abbreviations. I know it's a, it's a lot to keep up with. Um, so some Western miners' unions, particularly the British National Union of Mine Workers, or NUM, um, sought dialogue with Soviet miners' unions. And dis despite their differing politics, different actors within the, the NUM, such as Joe Gormley and Arthur Scargill, were united in their frustration with the institutional barriers erected by the ICFTU in its quest to prevent bilateral exchanges between its affiliates and affiliates of the WFTU. Um, furthermore, Western miners' unions were concerned about the extensive development of weapons of mass destruction in both the Western Bloc and the Soviet Bloc. And uh, this concern was cemented by multiple computer glitches, um, which on a series of occasions between November 1979 and June 1980, mistakenly alerted the United States to incoming missile attacks by the Soviet Union. Um, the key architects of the IMO were the aforementioned British National Union of Mine Workers, or NUM, and the French Confédération Générale du Travail, or CGT. And the first objective articulated by the architect of the IMO was the eradication of Cold War divisions within the international trade union movement of miners. So, eradicating Cold War divisions, or so they avowed, um, would generate international unity between miners, allowing them to unitarily campaign for fair wages and fair employment. This unity would also act as an antidote to the pernicious power of the forces of global capital. Um, and this objective harked back to the objectives of the International Working Men's Association, which was founded in London in 1864. Um, this association had emerged on the back of abortive attempts to economically emancipate workers and it recognised that these attempts had failed from the want of solidarity between the manifold divisions of labour in each country. Um, this objective was also, however, informed by the UK miners strike of 1984-5 when the lack of international unity prevented the British National Union of Mine Workers from legitimately receiving financial and practical assistance from the Soviet Miners' Union. Um, so the, the IMO actually convened a special conference on employment in London in November 1986 and there, the main objectives of the IMO relating to employment were restated. So the IMO sought the right to a job for all, um, job security, wage security, and protection from unfair dismissals, which are all fairly typical demands of the international trade union movement, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and the journal produced by the IMO uh, often satirised the issue of fair wages with the help of cartoons, um, highlighting the absurdity of operational wage policies, especially in the Western Bloc. So we can see here with this cartoon, there's this kind of demonic <coughs> employer who says, um, as you cannot support your wife on present pay, we have compiled a list of divorce lawyers. Um, so the second stated objective of the IMO was the achievement of positive technological development within mines. Um, the architects of the IMO were very keen to voice their support for technological development, which would better the working conditions of miners, but which would not lead to the unemployment and disenfranchisement of miners. Um, so on the right here, we can see another cartoon from the journal. Again, this kind of demonized employer 
um, who says, science has learned how to il eliminate the misery, monotony and drudgery of your job. You're fired. Uh, as in, you're replaced by, by a machine, if it wasn't clear. <laughs> um, and the final stated objective of the IMO was the attainment of nuclear disarmament. Um, whilst the other objectives which I've spoken about had united miners in particular since as early as 1890, uh, when the Miners International Federation was founded, this objective was particular to the Cold War. Um, an international trade secretariat was supposedly necessi necess necessitated, which would unite miners from every part of the globe and enable them to collaboratively and therefore effectively campaign for nuclear disarmament. And according to an IMO executive committee member, um, an effective campaign for nuclear disarmament would both dispel the threat of nuclear holocaust and liberate the gigantic sums of money devoted to weapons for investment in wages, worker safety and unemployment insurance. Um, and the IMO convened a special conference on nuclear disarmament in Sydney in November 1987. And we see the poster for this conference here. Um, and now briefly, as for the, the kind of responses elicited by the establishment of the IMO, um, we can say that some international trade secretariats, such as the International Federation of Audiovisual Workers Unions, or FISTAV, um, agreed with the unified approach taken by the IMO and they expressed their support. Um, however, not all Western miners' unions were so enthusiastic about the IMO. In particular, the, Western, uh, the West German Miners' Union and the French Socialist Trade Union Force Ouvrière uh, denounced the IMO as a communist front. Um, it's fair to say that the IMO elicited controversy, um, something that's perfectly demonstrated, in fact, by the nature of its demise, uh, which unfortunately I don't have time to elaborate on in my, my presentation. Um, so coming to a conclusion, um, the establishment of the IMO came about because of the frustration of some Western miners' unions with the impossibility of dialogue with Soviet miners' unions. And the desire for international unity dated back to the 19th century and was not, in fact, exclusively tied up with the Cold War. Yet the frustration of some Western miners' unions with the extensive development of weapons of mass destruction and their consequent decision to establish a new international trade secretariat was a peculiarity of the Cold War. Um, the study of the IMO contributes to the study of Cold War international relations by highlighting the tensions which mediated the relationships between subnational uh, entities such as miners' unions, which had historically nurtured internationalist aspirations. It also contributes to the perennially expanding history of the permeability of the Iron Curtain by highlighting the role played by non-governmental organisations such as miners' unions in traversing Cold War barriers. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Grace, for a lovely presentation. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating uh, for, for both of you how excellent and how how curious how 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 good ideas come up pop up in these presentations uh, perhaps i wouldn't expect uh, as far as the building of the un is concerned or the international miners union I, I perhaps would not expect such an interesting topic but it was indeed congratulations and thank you very much and i'm sure many questions will pop up now, I think it's time to turn to our technician to ask if uh, our colleague Gabriel Zvinka is online or um, not. Not yet, I just... Not the, yet. Uh, should we proceed on with, uh, and then to come back to him because, or should we turn to questions and answers? No. Okay, oh, then, oh, okay. Okay. okay then, is it okay if... Yeah. No, I don't have a presentation. Okay, so we make the, the I medicines... Think will, sorry, I think he will join in a few... Seconds. Few seconds. <laughs> Good. <coughs> Let's wait. Few seconds. If not, then we move on. It's all right. It's all right. I, I think I would propose to wait a few minutes, yeah. and if it's okay, um, Daniel, it's uh, what struck me yeah. is that uh, certainly when we uh, historians speak about the UN, and especially under the influence of the recent. Um, uh, events regarding the war 
between Russia and Ukraine, uh, what pop up, pops up is the it's a political question how decisions are made in the uh, United Nations. Uh, but it's, it was your approach, um, and especially for me, the the architectural side of the of the of this uh, endeavor that was really really interesting. And I think you grabbed the point from a, an interesting part of you part of the story. And as to Grace, uh, since or until we are waiting for the response. Um, Mining and being a miner in Eastern and Central Europe was something exceptional. I remember in my school years in 1970s, in the middle of 1970s, early 80s, uh, recruiters came into the classroom and recruiting, <laughs> asking boys, well, boys only, uh, would you like to become a, a miner? <laughs> and it was something exceptional, even in the 1970s. Uh, later on, I think it's, it's lost its importance uh, by the time. Okay, then. Maybe she, she I would propose yeah. to carry on. Okay, great. And it's a uh, medicine surgeon. Uh, she's going to have her presentation. Uh, Madison, the floor is yours. Okay. Do, do you want to turn on the light for you? Or is it okay? I well, think you? it's either or. Okay. Um, As you wish. All right, we have a few more minutes before it's noon, so good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm presenting a paper titled The Warsaw Pact in the Black Sea, Hub and Spoke, or Something More. Two notes before we proceed. I want to reiterate the many um, expressions of gratitude that have already been given especially to Dr. Victoria Phillips and the Cold War Archives Research Institute. Um, they got many of the participants here to Budapest and have kept us fed for the past week and a half. Um, so many thanks to them. And then like Zach, I am trained as a political scientist, so that's where we're going today. Yeah. Um, prior to, during, and following the end of the Cold War, policy scholars and practitioners debated the utility of military blocs in Europe. The Warsaw Pact dissolved. NATO did not. Accordingly, interalliance politics remains a sizable subfield of political science that seeks to understand institutional and state power within the international system. Work on interalliance politics, however, largely relies on NATO as a singular case study, but the declassification of documents and emerging theoretical frameworks have permitted scholars to revisit understandings of the Warsaw Pact. Following newer traditions of examining processes and structures from the bottom up, my research looks at how Warsaw Pact states, namely Bulgaria and Romania, were able to exercise policy autonomy, if at all, within the parameters of the alliance. I argue that despite its intended purpose as a means of Soviet hegemony, the Warsaw Pact provided an institutional framework for Eastern Bloc states to exercise a degree of autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and their foreign policy. While NATO's evolution during, and especially after the Cold War, is well documented, scholars hardly agree on what the Warsaw Pact actually was. The Soviet leadership described the pact as the main center for coordinating foreign policy among the European communist states. And those that subscribe to this view regard changes in the institutional design of the pact as less significant compared to the overwhelming amount of control that the Soviet Union possessed over the alliance and its member states. Therefore, examples of member states' defiance and variation in behavior are viewed as aberrations, not patterns. For others, the shifting alliance design and behavior of member states signaled something different and an increase in autonomy and willingness to push against or nudge Moscow towards specific behavior. The Soviet Union's responses, whether it be timid acceptance or positive action towards the desired outcomes of states, further support this latter interpretation. The Warsaw Pact was established in 1955 as a counterpart to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and was essentially bureaucratically bare-boned in the beginning. It lacked an institutional structure entirely and could be best conceptualized as a club of states though its members did not have formal means of coordinating policy, budgets, or military operations outside of the political consultative committee. The events in Hungary and Poland in 1956 revealed the necessity of establishing a series of status of force agreements with the non-Soviet pact states, military coordination and integration that Moscow intended to maintain discipline and political unity among members, but which actually encouraged challenges to Soviet dominance by providing formalized mechanisms for states to express dissent, initiative, or collaboration. After 1956, a mixture of bilateral and multilateral consultations was adopted, and beginning at the end of the 1960s, meetings of the deputy foreign ministers had become a regular forum for multilateral consultation. 
In fact, Romania supported these ad hoc meetings, even though we'll later find out that Romania opposed a lot of uh, integration and collaboration among, within the Warsaw Pact. Um, but they did support this initiative because Bucharest believed that regular consultations without any obligation was in fact useful to its own objectives. Furthermore, Bulgaria and Romania are useful case studies because at an initial glance, they occupy the opposite ends of the spectrum of Soviet allegiance. Romania's resistance to military integration beginning in the early 60s is well documented, while Bulgaria is understood to have been Moscow's staunchest ally within the pact. This divergence is evident when analyzing the country's military affairs. However, when considering the functions of the political body of the Warsaw Pact, which is to coordinate foreign policy, but also to promote economic and cultural intercourse within the pact, the Eastern Bloc states were acting to some degree autonomously becomes a stronger argument even for a state like Bulgaria. All the more striking is that Bulgaria and Romania were and are Black Sea states. The region was considered a Soviet lake by the West um, during the Cold War, where Moscow's power dominated local affairs. And of course, when speaking to the balance of power between the US and NATO and uh, the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, there is a local advantage um, towards the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Um, but once you examine the maneuvers of the Eastern Bloc states, it suggests a weaker position for Moscow than previously understood. And I hope to convey to you today that this space was not an uncontested region, not because the US or NATO was actively challenging the Soviet Union in, this, in the Black Sea, it wasn't, but because persistent dissent within the pact was actually coming from this space. Before going into examples, it should be noted that here that even in instances in which pact states displayed a fierce pro-Soviet posture, states may have to some degree acted on their own accord. This would be a weak argument unless you consider the fact that fellow members were not always towing the line. In other words, Romania's independent posture and Bulgaria's pro-Soviet orientation may both be seen as policy choices made by autonomous actors who simply desire different outcomes. In the same way that states like Romania use their increased leverage within the pact of Soviet, or to weaken Soviet control, excuse me, over regional and local affairs, states like Bulgaria use their position to strengthen it. Because Romania did not leave the pact, it maintained a degree of leverage over its counterparts with respect to pact functions. This included policy decisions, but actual operations as well. By the end of the 1960s, for example, intelligence gathering about NATO in southeastern Europe and the Middle East largely fell on the Bulgarian intelligence services, despite being delegated to both the Bulgarians and Romanians, simply because Romania refused to fulfill its obligation. A council of foreign ministers and a permanent secretariat were not established until 1976 because Romania blocked efforts to establish these bodies, critical to streamlining military and political efforts. Still, even Romania's position was not stagnant. Romania's independence was not always ardent, nor were observers confident that the Soviet Union would not invade the country in response to its acts of defiance. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, Romania's foreign minister informed his U.S. counterpart that Romania would remain neutral in the case of nuclear war. However, immediately prior to the crisis, Romania was actively participating in operational and tactical exercises with other Warsaw Pact states. Then, in 1970, Bucharest, which had previously resisted engagement, eventually softened its position against multilateral war games in the general vicinity of its territory due to Soviet pressure. Just the next year, Romania then blocked the passage of Soviet troops through its territory to conduct exercises in Bulgaria. In 1978, when Romania resisted increases in defense expenditures and the integration of the pact military uh, command structure, Radio Moscow took to lecturing Romanian listeners on the importance of defense capacity, arguing that it was critical for the state's security to match NATO countries' armament course. In an effort to legitimize Moscow's position, Radio Moscow actually emphasized Poland's aversion to weakening the pact's defense capacity, a position not unlike that of Bulgaria. Nevertheless, no official condemnation from Moscow was actually expressed. Similarly, Bulgaria's pro-Soviet orientation may be attributed to its own initiative and help perceive threats to its national security. In April 1957, the, the Allied Military Command of the Warsaw Pact in Moscow notified Bulgaria that the U.S. and Greece were allegedly discussing the creation of a nuclear base on Crete and that U.S.-made missiles would be delivered to Turkey. In response, Bulgaria requested that the Kremlin provide patrol boats, torpedo boats, and submarines for the Bulgarian Black Sea coast. In this instance, Bulgaria actually sought, sought the support of the Soviet Union and did not simply assume Moscow would take appropriate action. In December 1968, the arrival of the U.S. Navy in the Black Sea prompted demonstrations and objection in Bulgaria against this so-called provocation. 
Bulgaria's aversion to the U.S. presence was so great that the state's delegation to Turkey made representations to Ankara, protesting the presence of two American destroyers in the Black Sea. In contrast, Romania displayed a rather muffled objection to the U.S. presence in the region. And on December 9, 1968, Radio Bucharest stated that the presence of U.S. destroyers in the Black Sea in no way contributes to a climate favorable to international detente, but to its opposite. One Radio Free Europe researcher compared the responses describing the Romanian one as mild. Regardless of these differences, Bulgaria and Romania were able to utilize the Warsaw Pact design in yet another way to coordinate their foreign policies away from Moscow. For example, Bulgaria and Romania both supported the creation of a nuclear-free zone in the Balkans, and many of the meetings between uh, Ceausescu and uh, Zivkov but also other members of their respective governments emphasized bilateral cooperation on achieving this end. Moreover, in December 1984, on the eve of the potential renewal of the Warsaw Pact Treaty, Ceausescu first discussed the issue with his Bulgarian counterpart. These were discussions facilitated by the institutional design of the Warsaw Pact. Because of the limited military cooperation that actually occurred between the Pact states, not least thanks to Romania's efforts to kneecap integration, Political engagements both within and without the pact become more significant when analyzing the significance of its organization. And actually, in this regard, it can be suggested that all states acted with some degree of independence. Throughout the Cold War, both Bulgaria and Romania engaged in bilateral economic and cultural engagements, both behind and across the Iron Curtain. Though I, for the sake of brevity, I will just focus on Bulgaria in this section. Um, and also because it's very clear that Romania dissented a lot in, within the Warsaw Pact. Um, something I found interesting when I was doing my research was actually Bulgaria's interest and ability in engaging with non-communist states um, in matters of economic and cultural exchange. So, for example, in 1964, an agreement between Athens and Sofia mostly uh, warmed post-war hostilities between Greece and Bulgaria and allowed for the normalization of relations in culture, trade, and communications. Particularly during the 1980s, Bulgaria became increasingly involved in talks with Turkey and other regional states. Um, about setting up a regional economic and cultural exchange, and this was the beginning of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization founded in the 1990s that exists today. During this decade, uh, Bulgaria also engaged regularly with states such as Belgium and Denmark in order to promote cooperation in the sphere of culture, science, and education. And I think there was quite a bit of um, funding going back and forth for, for film, like film uh, development and studies as well, but particularly between Denmark and Bulgaria. That was very fascinating. Um, and then uh, notably, Bulgaria was the second East European state to reestablish diplomatic ties with Albania in 1988. Looking specifically within the Warsaw Pact, some scholars have noted that the Soviet decision to bring about uh, closer military integration among the Bloc states in order to maintain discipline and political unity actually accelerated a trend of uh, independent political and economic orientations. A larger research project would require an assessment of all inter-alliance and external relationships Eastern Bloc countries made. Albania's exit from the alliance, uh, you know, relatively scotch-free, no invasion by the Soviet Union, uh, Poland's aversion to Cuba's Warsaw Pact candidacy, and East Germany's manipulation of the pact to control relations with West Germany are other phenomena worthy of investigation in order to fully develop an understanding of the power differentials within the Warsaw Pact. Here, I've sought to utilize the cases of Bulgaria and Romania, states belonging to the so-called Soviet Lake region, to illustrate that the Warsaw Pact actually provided an institutional framework for states to exercise a degree of autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and their foreign policy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madison. It was even shorter. We made it in 12 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but it was wonderful to listen to. Uh, power differentiations. Yeah. One idea what I picked up from your lecture. Thank you very much. Now I also again turn to our technician and ask him. <laughs> yeah, he's he's here. All right. We have. A, we are glad him here. We have a, to ha have him on the board. Hello, Daniel. Can you hear me? Gabriel. Gabriel, sorry. Hello, Gabriel. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Hello. 
I think he can. We see you. We can't hear you. Maybe he's muted. Isn't it? No. 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 It might be on his end that he's muted. That seems so bad. No, but it doesn't say that he's muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, now. Hello, Gabriel. <laughs> Hello, hello. Okay, we, now we hear you clearly. Wonderful. Can you hear us as well? Yeah, I do. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Welcome on board. Uh, the panel of this morning session has already been on for some time now, nearly an hour. And we are really glad to have you on the board. Uh, if you are ready to have your lecture, then uh, then it's all right. You will have 15 minutes to have your presentation. And after your presentation, we will have questions and answer session. And uh, we expect you also to participate in the uh, question and answer session. Is it all right? Is it OK with you? Yeah, it's perfect. And thank you very much for having me in this uh, beautiful way. And I really, I'm really, really grateful for technology that involved that much. And that I can be there with you. Uh, people not physically, but at least you can hear me, you can see me, and I can see you as well. And that's that's perfectly fine for me. So if I have 15 minutes, I should start right away. And I'll just, I'm just going to uh, share my screen because I prefer the uh, presentation. Please tell me if you can see it. Yes, we see it. Okay, let me just make it on full screen. Okay, that's perfect. I, I can see. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, just one more thing while I'm presenting, I'm asking Danny if you could please mute yourself because I can hear a little bit of myself and I can't really, really focus. And uh, yeah, that's perfect. I see that you muted yourself. So I have 15 minutes. I should start right away. So basically, Hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel Zbunka. I'm from Babish Boy University in Cluj Napoca, Romania. And today I'm going to present a little bit about the United Nations peacekeeping mechanism during the Deton period, and more exactly the years 1973 and 1974. And um, yes, there we go. Um, the structure of this presentation is going to be as follows. Basically, I'll present the scope of this research that I've made, the purpose of it, and the methodologies and sources used. Then I'll present a little bit of details about the Detente period and how this influenced the peacekeeping mechanism. I will then shift the focus on the United Nations involvement in the Middle East because the period selected has uh, it's of great importance because during the 1973-1974 we know that uh, the Yom Kippur War took place in October 1973 and the UN got involved in authorized operations and therefore I will get into details about the this war and the UN involvement and then I'll shift the focus to the role of the Secretary General because in order to analyze the peacekeeping mechanism, um, the, the administrative head of the organization was the one who was actually coordinating the peacekeeping mechanism. And therefore, in order to assess the way through which the peacekeeping mechanism was in that period, we have to focus on the role of the secretary general. And after this, I'll present the conclusions. Therefore, I already mentioned I'm going to focus on the peacekeeping mechanism and its importance during the Tatan period. I'm trying, I'll, I'll try to focus a little bit on how the UN got involved in the Middle East. What was the role of the organization, how it cooperated with the two superpowers, um, and here I mean the United States and the Soviet Union. And after that, I'll focus on Kurt Walheim. Basically, the methodology that I use is based on diachronic exposure, by which I'll try to get a little bit more on details of the days of the October 1973. And by qualitative analysis, I'll try to uh, examine the documents and the memoirs of Kurt Walheim in order to see if he had an importance during these um, crises or not. After that, uh, the, the, um, uh, I, I already used constructivism in order to see if uh, the organization had actually something to, um, uh, to, to, to influence the collaboration between um, the collaboration, more exactly, uh, if it uh, had the opportunity to place some norms, some uh, influences over the, the crises. The sources that I appeal to are based on primary sources, which are the UN documents and here I mean resolutions, transcripts of uh, discussions in the Security Council, memoirs of Kurt Walheim and Henry Kissinger, and also of secondary sources, the um, uh, other uh, scientific articles and books that have been written on the subject. 
end, the detente period. So basically we know that the Cold War was uh, somehow divided into more uh, phases. We have the first Cold War with uh, its uh, the, um, um, phases, and we also had the detente period, which is basically at the end of the 1960s to the end of the 1970s. The second Cold War during the 1980s, and we know the um, way Ronald Reagan mentioned and started this uh, second Cold War by calling the United, the Soviet Union, the Empire of Evil. And then we have the end of the Cold War, 1989 and 1992. Um, I'll focus on the detent period because this one is, it's important in order to assess how the United Nations was actually involved by the superpowers in the crisis of uh, that period and how uh, the detente period actually came into into fact after the first cold war what happened well we we, we basically have the tow period which is from 1954 to 1963 and here we have that based mutual assured destruction theory by which both superpowers acknowledge the fact that if they're going to start a war between each other uh, there's going to be a total destruction of the planet and it was not somehow um, very very uh, productive for them and it was not beneficial for any of the parties Parties. And therefore, after the Cuba and missile crisis of 1962, they understood that uh, there are some benefits from um, uh, economic and technical interdependence. And also, they uh, assess the fact that international problems could be addressed cooperatively and not separately, because that will lead to somehow a mutual a short destruction between the two, because the interests are going to get um, to, to, to challenge each other. And now the UN involvement in the Middle East. I mentioned in this PowerPoint that it was the main region during the Cold War when the peacekeeping mechanism was implemented, tested and developed. And more about the peacekeeping mechanism, it was somehow developed at the end of the 1940s and more exactly after 1956 with the United Nations Emergency Force. And basically it meant that the um, UN had the possibility uh, through authorized operations based somehow on chapter six and seven of the UN Charter in conflicts that were taking place between states. And uh, in the 1956, we had the Swiss crisis. And we know that uh, Israel intervened in Suez and also we had the, the French and the, the, the Britons. But uh, after the crisis was somehow um, addressed to the UN, the then Secretary General, Doug Hammarhold, came up with a plan of trying to interpose between the two sides and assure that the, um, the um, ceasefire is going to be respected by both. And therefore, he authorized more than 1,000 of troops of the UN, the so-called Blue Helmets, to interpose between the two. After the 1956, when it's called, when it's in the in literature is considered to be the year when the peacekeeping mechanism was actually implemented. In 1958, what happened? Doug Hammarhall presented in the General Assembly a report of the United Nations Emergency Force, and he gave a list of principles of for the peacekeeping mechanism and operations that have to be considered, which are to this day actually taken into consideration. And we have the three most important ones. And uh, some researchers call it the holy trinity of peacekeeping, which are the concept of states. Therefore, if the operations are going to be authorized, the states on which the troops are going to be deployed have to agree to this deployment. Then we have the impartiality of the operation by which it should not interfere between the two um, uh, but between the two sides or the sides and should try to maintain neutrality and try to not get involved in the conflict as happened, if I'm going to give you an example, in the Congo crisis of 1960s. And also the use of force only in self-defense cases. And this is very important because um, use of force was is somehow authorized or is permitted by the United Nations through chapter seven, but we know during the Cold War, the Security Council was divided between the two superpowers and they were not agreeing on another entity as the UN to use force in order to solve a conflict or not. And therefore, as I mentioned uh, somehow at the beginning, peacekeeping mechanism is based on the so-called chapter six and a half because it also involves chapters from uh, articles from chapter six, but also it has this possibility of using force only if they are, are, they are getting attacked. And now um, the Yom Kippur and the UN involvement. After 1956, 
we had the United Nations Emergency Force was actually deployed between the Israel and Egypt until 1967, when then the Egypt uh, uh, president um, uh, called uh, Nasser, I mean, um, uh, uh, called on the then Secretary General Yuton to withdraw the troops. And after that, we know that in 1967 to the place, the Six Day War between the Israel and, uh, uh, and uh, Egypt and Syria. And after that, uh, it is considered that in 1967, what actually happened is, is somehow like a, a defeat for the UN because it could not prevent the extent of this conflict. And therefore, uh, between 1967 and 1973, we had no UN operations and uh, literature call it the dormant period when nothing happened, basically. But in the Middle East, things were actually getting worse and worse. Mohamed Heika was a commentator from Egypt who said that there was no peace and no war in the region. But uh, we know that actually something did happen after the death of Nasser. We had Sadat who came into power and he tried to uh, somehow solve what happened in 1967. And he was actually preparing for another war. And this happened in October, more exactly 6 October, on the holy Jewish day of Yom Kippur, when Egyptians and Syrian troops entered the Israeli territory and pushed back the Israelis. But uh, what happened afterwards, there were this, some discussions in the Security Council of the UN, but there was no serious progress made towards peace because the superpowers were somehow indirectly involved because we know Israel is a client of the United States and then uh, Syria and Egypt was um, clients of the Soviet Union. And therefore, for like about two weeks, there was even a, di a direct confrontation between the superpowers because their interests were somehow getting challenged because they were trying to support the clients in the region. And therefore, um, after uh, some discussions in the Security Council and after Henry Kissinger tried to uh, mediate the conflict, um, they were passed several important resolutions from 22 to 27 October. And here I mean resolution 338, 339, 340, and 341. Uh, what is interesting for our analysis, for my analysis, is actually the resolution 339 from 1973, which asked the Secretary General to dispatch UN observers to supervise the observance of the ceasefire between the forces of Israel and the Arab Republic of Egypt. Because I mentioned Henry Kissinger was actually actually convinced the Israelis and the Egyptians to come with a ceasefire and therefore the UN was mandated in order to intervene in the two spheres. And we also have resolution 340 by which it increased the number of the servers and took into consideration the deployment of United Nations Emergency Force in the area after report of the Secretary General, but we'll get a little bit on, on detail on these resolutions lately. Uh, later, I mean. Now, what did the Secretary General did during this, uh, this crisis? Well, then Secretary General was Kurt Walheim, which you have in here, like uh, with wearing sunglasses. And it was considered to be the main architect of United Nations Emergency Force uh, second uh, for its deployment and activity. He was actually uh, in, uh, invested into this mandate in 1971. And from 1971 to 1973, he tried to somehow prevent a direct confrontation between the two sides. In 1973, in the summer, he actually had the tournaments where he visited Cairo, Damascus, and his, in, uh, Jerusalem in order to come with a, with a plan in order to prevent the conflict because he was getting reports for uh, the United Nations Truth Observation Mission that was uh, the possibility of direct conflict between the, between the sides. But, there, but he made no improvement. When the conflict started in 6 October 1973, he was telephoned by Henry Kissinger, who was, as we know, Secretary of State of the United States, to contact the Syrians to refrain from action. Uh, and it's very interesting because Kissinger in his memoirs argued that Walheim was not able to influence substantive discussions, but he had the ability to foster procedural matters such as organizing Security Council or General Assembly meetings. And um, after um, this, um, after the conflict was not somehow getting stopped, and uh, we, we know that started on 6 October 1973, and actually uh, a ceasefire was agreed after 20 October, um, Waldheim tried to position himself, he tried to give a voice to the planet, and he presented on uh, 11th of October uh, his arguments that um, uh, 
somehow the Security Council, sh Council should consider the, the problem and should do something about it. He therefore called upon member states of the Council to find the needed mutual cooperation, and here he is referring directly to the superpowers, to turn, and I quote, this tragic conflict into a starting point for a new effort at a real settlement end of quote. And afterwards, his appeal might have been, as he mentioned in his memoirs, I quote, drops of water falling on a stone, but he further argued that it was his duty to give voice of the yearning of people everywhere for peace. But unfortunately, situation did not improve after the statement and only after the superpowers came into consideration that it is not beneficial for them to uh, get directly involved in the conflict and somehow get to fight each other, they started to take the matters to the Security Council where they passed uh, several resolutions. Okay, uh, what has happened after the ceasefire? Um, Waldheim actually called Kissinger to suggest him the deployment of a peacekeeping mission with troops from small, small countries. countries. Gabriel, Firstly, Gabriel, can uh, you hear me? Yes. yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but the 15 minutes limit is almost up. So I kindly yes. ask you, to spare some time for discussion, I kindly ask you to make your yes. final conclusions, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, basically um, uh, what he did after that, he he tried to contact Kissinger and told him that uh, United Nations peacekeeping mission should be in, um, deployed in, in, the, in the area. Kissinger was at the first point, he did not, he was not that open to the, uh, to the idea, but he actually took into consideration and explained it to the Israelis and the uh, Egyptians that this this could happen and that the, there might be even uh, American troops involved. What has happened is the fact that the resolution 339, 314, 341 were, were passed by the uh, Security Council, and therefore the, the second United Nations Emergency Force was deployed. What was the role of the Secretary General in this sphere? He as we know by the UN Charter, he's not uh, mandated in order to uh, adopt these measures or to do something about it. But when the Security Council approves about something, the Secretary General is the one who actually is uh, has a view over the situation and his view is transmitted over the operation that took forms. And therefore he managed to uh, deploy troops in the area from several countries. And therefore, even though we might say that uh, the peacekeeping mechanism during this period, as uh, Nori McQueen mentioned, was somehow between having independence and authority and being um, under the uh, direct uh, influence of, of the Security Council and of the superpowers, I think, and this is what the research I have made came to the conclusion that even though at the formal fo uh, phase, the peacekeeping mechanism was under the superpowers because they had to agree on the facts. What has actually happened on the on the field, on the battlefield, was actually the view of the UN by the uh, Secretary General. And therefore, we might say that it was somehow medium under the superpowers and that the UN had actually an important part to play in these crises. And that's, that, that was my presentation. Sorry for being a little bit too detailed and not take into consideration the time. Thank you very much. It's all right. Thank you very much. I heard you. I, I hope you heard the applause you deserve. Thank you very much for the informative and interesting presentation. Uh, dear uh, participants of the conference, I would propose a kind of a 10 minutes. Do we have 10 minutes, Professor? Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 minutes long uh, debate. Excuse me. I'm sure we turn off the light. Yeah. Yes, I think it's a good idea to turn off the lights. And I open the floor for questions, please. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you very, very much. I have a question, rather a comment from Grace Simpson, because um, mm, I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at OSA, and now I'm doing something which is not related to labor issue, issues. But when I was a visual fellow, I studied the topic of working class descent in the Soviet Union. And like the chair of the panel said, yes, in Central Europe to be a minor might have been prestigious, but it was and it is everywhere dangerous, and very much so. And so it is very one of the most important roles of a minor uh, union is to ensure that there are proper safety measures so that the least possible people die in the pits, because that can happen quite often. You, you mentioned Joe Gorley. I was wondering whether you encountered in, your, in the sources the polemic that there was uh, about Vladimir Klebanov, who was a Soviet 
worker to try to fund an independent trade union in the Soviet Union, which they were not allowed, mm. of, of, of course, because Soviet Soviet Union were state organs. And uh, especially in the British press, and especially if you look at the articles written by this British journalist, whose name I think was Bernard Levin, there was a very hot uh, and I would say aggressive polemic about that, because seeming, seemingly, Gordley believed the official Soviet expl explanation that uh, Vladimir Kabanov was deranged mentally, yeah. deranged that he was not mm -hmm. really a trade union activist. So I was curious whether you found this story in the in your research. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Great, please. Um, it's a really brilliant question. I, I am familiar with this individual. Um, it may be helpful to, to clarify something, which is that this presentation is based on um, some of my findings as I was researching for my MA thesis, which dealt with um, the responses of this British uh, National Union of Mine Workers to the emergence of solidarity in Poland. And um, we can kind of trace some, some continuity between the way that this mining union responded to Klebanov's attempts to, um, to instigate free trade unionism in the Soviet Union and also the attempts to, to establish a free trade union in Poland. Um, the, the NUM maintained relations with the official uh, Soviet miners' union um, during, during this kind of episode with Klebanov. And... Um, this this was a kind of response which was which was replicated with solidarity, especially with Arthur Scargill, the the NUM president from uh, 1982. He expressed his kind of opposition to solidarity as an anti-socialist organisation. Um, he didn't buy into the kind of narrative that it was um, it was seeking to re-inject democracy into industrial relations in Poland, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's quite a complex issue uh, because the different actors within the NUM had different positions. Um, for example, there was the the um, the executive of the Scottish area of the NUM, Mick McGarhy, and he was uh, he was a communist. I mean, he was he had, he was originally part of the Communist Party in Britain, but he actually kind of dissented uh, the position of Arthur Scargill, and he actually demonstrated support for solidarity. Um, so it's it's fair to say that the the responses within this trade union are are pretty um, idiosyncratic and complex. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. Next question for, for at the back, please. Thank you. Um, um, I have questions here. The panelists are to be late for the time. Daniel, I want to ask you about the legal and intellectual concept of extraterritoriality. <laughs> you know, um, which is this kind of fantasy of the UN that we have with legal spaces like embassies. Um, have you, you engaged with this concept? Um, uh, yeah. Shall I? Yes, please. No, it's, it's a wonderful question. I mean, what I find very interesting of the Geneva movement more than New York, really, is that a lot of those rules were up for grabs. You know, now you ask an international lawyer, they will tell you, you know, there's a very established set of rules regarding the immunity of these organizations, of their personnel, of their staff. But in the 20s, it was like, we don't know how this works. Is this a military alliance? It's an international organization, it's a trade union. Mm -hmm. Which kind of legal regime should we apply? And I think the anecdote that I found most interesting regarding this is when the League of Nations is going to buy the Palais National, nowadays the Palais Wilson, where the Office of the High Commissioner yeah. for Human Rights is based, they will have to pay a tax to the municipality of Geneva. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the kind of liberal, let's say, nationalists in the, in the canton of Geneva, the Conseil d'Etat, said, no, you know, we, we need to exempt them from this tax. You know, they, this, is, this is part of Switzerland's commitment to the international order. And then you have a minority of communists and socialists mm -hmm. that said, no, this is a fake internationalism. <laughs> this is the internationalism of the liberals and the bourgeois. Uh, the true internationalism uh, is working class internationalism. Right. And we're not going to exempt taxes from the Palais, from the League to buy its Palais, while there are working class people uh, in Geneva dying of hunger. Uh, they lost that battle, but it shows you that many of those rules regarding how these organizations have their own kind of little cocoon separated from the domestic politics of their host states was something that really had to be invented. Thank you for the question and the answer. Two gentlemen in the second row, please. Who goes first? Um, well, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, my question's also for Daniel. Um, so I, was, uh, I wanted to ask about your point that the uh, UN headquarters was not only kind of like reflecting the aspirations for a new world, but also that you made the point that it was also kind of parochial and loyal to U.S. interests, you said. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, because obviously one of the um, comments or critiques that's made of the international style and modernism, more modern architecture more broadly, that it's kind of indifferent to local conditions and architectural traditions. So, um, in particular, because some of the architects you said were not 
uh, like, well, we're not Americans, but yeah. Should I? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah, I think that for me that, that's what's interesting of this style. It's how can you claim to be at the same time international but then committed to the kind of local traditions of your vernacular. And you know, later on there will be experimentations with this of people wanted to do like Latin American modernism, Afro-Asian modernism that tries to adapt that. I think that this idea that the UN building is sterile and is not literally say representative of the US tradition is not so much what I want to do. Because if you look at, for instance, what the Museum of Modern Art, what the MoMA was doing, it is very much in line of their vision of architecture. Rather, what I find interesting is how, and I think this resonates with, with all the panelists and with all of us, and it's how do we understand these visions of the internationalism? And how do we see that there is not only one kind of liberal internationalism rules-based order that we like to talk about, but how there were many other visions of that internationalism, and how at the end of the day, it was this kind of more US-centric, the one that had the day it's court in New York. And maybe that's good, but maybe that's also problematic. Thank you. One more question from the floor, and then I will give the floor to Professor Bekesh to close of the the morning panel session, or what? Just Any comment? comment. Just yes. comment. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a like, small question for Grace. Uh, I wonder if like, I'm intriguing to see like the international minor union movement, like uh, aid some like the principles about the disarmament, disarmament like movement to the counter the the nuclear stress. So I wonder if the strategy to attract more like a common goals in the Eastern Europe, uh, in the Eastern Europe, or like, is uh, just uh, adoption of the general agenda of the European left movement in the 1980s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, it's a good question. I'm just trying to <clears throat> mentally work through it a little bit. Um, as for the kind of relationship between this, the actors of the International Miners Organization and um, other activist groups, for example, like those involved in the CND, uh, we can say that there's there's no real identifiable connection, because within, uh, especially within, I mean, I can mainly speak to the the British Union, um, is that there's this kind of. Um, innate suspicion of these new social movements, right? Because they're, they take this networked form and um, there's this kind of, I guess, opposition on behalf of certain trade unions um, towards any kind of collaboration with these bodies. So um, just very briefly, I, I would say that um, there was a lack of alignment between like um, what was happening within civil society, let's say, and what was happening within these trade unions in Europe uh, regarding nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions and for the answers. And I can give the floor to Professor Bekesh to have his reactions, please. Thank you very much. Well, actually, just two uh, short comments. And um, uh, one is for Madison uh, about uh, Bulgarian relations with Western European countries. And you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, um, Denmark, I think, and other countries. Uh, I just would like to draw your attention uh, to West Germany. Uh, because there were all kinds of contacts uh, between the Eastern European countries with uh, Western European countries, but the most important um, uh, partner in all cases, including Bulgaria, uh, it was West Germany. So you should um, try to find sources and, and uh, documents and, and uh, evidence uh, about that kind of relationship, because, uh, because the, the most important driving force was not culture or, or any kind of relationship like that, but economy. Uh, trade relations, economic relations, that was the core of the, of the driving forces uh, on the side of the Soviet Bloc countries. And th this was true for all the, all the countries, including Bulgaria. And the other comment is on uh, Gabriel's um, uh, presentation, which was very informative and, and very well uh, put together. Uh, just uh, here, I would like to make one comment on the, on the general chronology, what you presented at the very beginning, because it's uh, uh, for, uh, for public use. Uh, because this is a very traditional, uh, very traditional uh, kind of presentation. It, it, it's, it's normal because you, you were working from what you have, that is the mainstream literature. And the mainstream literature has that uh, there was such a thing as a second world war. Uh, where sometimes in the late 1970s and throughout the 1980s, and he uh, actually, um, uh, Gabriel uh, presented it like the, what is the second world war, the 1980s. Well, it, it is quite striking if you think about Gorbachev. Well, right? uh, under Gorbachev, can we talk about the Second World War, even if, if somebody likes this idea, which I don't. Uh, so then uh, I would like to draw uh, your attention to the, to the fact that uh, this mainstream uh, 
uh, idea is very much challenged in the in the past decades by by new, newly emerging scholarship in which I am one of the promoter of the idea that there was no second Cold War. That just one one Cold War from the beginning to the end. That is 1945 to 1991. That was a Cold War structure, and there were all kinds of um, um, phases of this. Uh, but in this, uh, altogether, of course, um, uh, we can talk uh, uh, about no uh, second Cold War in the 19. Uh, late 70s and 1980s, because they, uh, the structure didn't change at all. The kind of um, uh, uh, contradiction between the two sides, uh, the two superpowers, was exactly the same as it was earlier. Uh, so the the, uh, the the rhetoric of Reagan, which was also quoted, um, like the evil empire kind of thing, now it's becoming uh, more and more uh, evident <coughs> that this was uh, just propaganda. Uh, the uh, the real politic, um, uh, foreign policy line of the United States, even in the first uh, first administration of Reagan between 1980 and 1984, uh, even at that time, even at that time, uh, the, the, the kind of the conflict and the confrontation was absolutely not so serious as it looked like at the time, on the basis of public announcements. Uh, and uh, uh, now there's new emerging literature based on the, uh, um, the White House papers and the uh, all kinds of American pa uh, papers of the, of the early 1980s. So it's not about uh, just uh, using the contemporary sources um, uh, as, uh, as previously, and from this is uh, absolutely this kind of uh, new interpretation is absolutely being uh, being confirmed uh, that the, the confrontation was uh, was much less in, in reality between the two superpowers, even even in those other otherwise turbulent three years. Uh, but it did not change uh, the logic of the Cold War, so it cannot be labeled a kind of a new <coughs> phase of the Cold War or something special. Uh, so that's something which uh, I, I'm drawing uh, your attention to, because um, if you want to be up to date, uh, uh, as far as Cold War historiography is concerned, that's very important to know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bekesh, for your comments. And I would like to uh, thank, uh, on behalf of the organizers and on, on myself, the, our presenters for their lovely presentations, uh, Daniel, Grace, uh, Madison, and Gabriel. I, I hope you hear us. Thank you very much for your presentations. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for uh, questions and answers, but we will have uh, uh, opportunity to ask each other and talk to each other during the break. Thank you very much. It was a great panel. Give them a big hand.